Hello and welcome to the third and final lesson in our course on advanced material selection. Today we'll be going through a case example of selecting a material for a car door panel, which is going to require us to utilize multiple objectives during the ranking stage. We'll also be using some advanced software tools within ANSYS Grant to EduPack to consider other aspects of design. Specifically for this example, we're trying to explore whether polymeric materials can replace the more traditional steel materials for a car door panel. I'll be using the level three polymer database within ANSYS Granta EduPack to do this selection. If you're following along with an ANSYS Granta selector license, you should be able to do this example using the standard material universe data available to you. As always, when starting a selection, we want to use the Ashby selection methodology shown here. While this example is more complex than others that we've done in this course series, the main steps are the same. So we'll start with translation. The function of a car door can be considered to be a panel in bending that's limited by stiffness. We wouldn't want the car door to flex too much during use. While strength is important here, a lot of strength will actually be provided by the frame of the car, so we can just use strength as a constraint. Speaking of constraints, we have a pretty extensive list here, but that's good. That means that we are going to be screening out more materials and removing those unsuitable candidates from selection. We have constraints on mechanical properties, such as yield strength and fracture toughness, as well as thermal and durability requirements because cars are driven in all kinds of weather. There's even some constraints based on acceptable manufacturing processes that we can be using for producing this panel. And finally, we move on to our objectives. We want to have a lightweight car door panel that is also cost effective while still performing well in our stiffness limited design. So that means we're going to need two performance indices, one for minimizing the mass and one for minimizing the cost performance. If we look at our performance index reference booklet, we can see that these performance indices are actually identical to the ones for the longboard example that we've been using the past couple of courses, where M1 for mass performance is density divided by Young's modulus to the one third power and M2 for cost performance is cost of material times density divided by Young's modulus to the one third power. Now that we've identified our performance indices and completed our translation step, we can move on to screening. Something we haven't talked about yet in this series is the materials that we start our screening process with. In all the rest of our examples, we've just looked at every material that's available to us. But what if you already know, based on your design requirements, that some material families just aren't going to be applicable? Let's look at this chart here of density versus price, which are the two properties we're trying to optimize. Looking at this chart here, we can tell that ceramics are just too brittle and foams, particulates and fibers are just not structurally sound enough for this particular application. So can we just remove them before selection starts? Moving to the software, in both ANSYS Granta EduPack and Granta Selector, we can choose what materials we start our screening and ranking processes with. For this example, let's create a custom subset of materials where we only consider composites, lightweight and ferrous metallic alloys, and polymers. This already drops the number of possible materials from over 4,000 to less than half. Next, we continue to remove unsuitable materials via regular property screening. First, we'll use a limit stage to apply the values for thermal, durability, and mechanical property limits as shown. Remember, if you're unfamiliar with how to use ANSYS Grant to EduPack, we have a comprehensive set of video tutorials linked both in the software and in the reference link segment of this course. Setting limits for acceptable manufacturing methods requires us to use a tree stage and the process universe records. Ultimately, we end up with around a thousand suitable candidates once the screening stage is complete. Now we can begin ranking. As shown in the previous course, in the advanced level three databases in Granta EduPack and in Granta Selector, we have the performance index finder tool. When we create our chart, instead of using a single or advanced property, we'll choose the performance index finder. Simply input our metrics, in this case, a panel in bending, free variable of thickness, stiffness limited, and for this axis, we're optimizing mass, 
and the index will automatically be calculated. Because we're in advanced databases, we're using flexural modulus, which means bending stiffness, instead of Young's modulus, for a more accurate result. We can do the same for the x-axis, except we're optimizing cost performance. And now we've created our trade-off plot. So what now? There are still a lot of materials here, and many that perform well with low performance index values. I can draw my trade-off curve manually using the tools in the software, and we can start looking at our non-dominant options near this curve, which can also be called a Pareto front. We can see that some aluminum alloys shown here in purple, some polypropylene polymers, a few steels, and even a couple composites touch the trade-off curve. But this isn't enough information for us to make a unique decision. What do we do? Well, what materials are car door panels normally made out of? We can use the search function in the software and type automotive door panels. We see that some dual phase steel alloys are in this list, which are a good traditional candidate. If we right click and say add to favorites, this makes it easier to find these specific alloys on our trade off plot. Now that they've been identified, we can see that clearly these steel alloys are winning in terms of cost performance, but they're a little bit heavy. Light metals, polymers, and composites are lighter weight, but have worse cost performance. Though our polypropylene-based materials appear to be a good polymeric compromise. This explains why mass-produced cars have steel doors. They're cheap, but expensive sports cars can have advanced carbon fiber doors, which are light. What if we take a sustainability approach and consider natural fiber composites? These aren't a material that we've considered so far within our database. So how can we look at these? To look at this, we're going to use an advanced tool within EduPack and Selector called the Synthesizer tool. This tool allows us to generate records or synthesize records to allow us to explore properties for materials that aren't available in the base software. For this particular case, we want to see if we can create a composite with natural materials that outperforms all the rest of our candidates for both of our performance indices. So we're targeting this lower left hand corner of our chart here. To do this, we're going to use the composites single bound module within the synthesizer tool. We were able to generate the data for a polypropylene matrix flax fiber reinforcement composite using this tool, which we have plotted on our chart here in orange. You can see that it's outperforming all the rest of our candidates for both performance indices, which is really promising. But manufacturing also has a cost, not just the material. And this is something we need to consider in our design. Perhaps this is why polymers and composites are often overlooked for car door panels in place of steel, the cost. We'll look at this using the part cost estimator module within the tool. We were able to generate the data for multiple materials and plot them on this part cost versus batch size chart. We can see our polypropylene flax fiber composite in orange compared with aluminum, steel, and even a polypropylene glass fiber composite. And unfortunately, our eco-friendly option is more expensive than traditional materials, particularly when it comes to large batch sizes, which are gonna be important for mass production. So what material do we pick? Well, that's gonna come down to the design, the designer, the intended customer, and a lot of other factors. But we've shown you how you can use ANSYS material selection software to look at the various criteria that come into play when you're trying to make this type of decision. Interested in learning what exactly we put into the software to make these selections? Check out the written industrial case study found in the references tab of this course. And with that, we've come to the end of our lesson our course and this course series. We started by introducing Ashby charts as a way to visualize material properties and compare materials and material families with one another. We also introduced the Ashby selection methodology, both basic and advanced, as a logical way to select materials during the design process and showed how you can plug this in alongside simulation for a holistic design approach. We've also introduced the concept of performance indices and shown how we can use them to rank materials based on function and properties. And we've shown some ways that you can start tackling the challenge of having multiple conflicting objectives that require trade-offs during design. 
We hope that we've been able to show you how important it is to perform material selection during the design process, and we've given you the tools so that you were able to tackle this challenge. My name is Dr. Caitlin Tyler, and I've been your instructor for these courses. Thank you so much for joining me, and I wish you all the best on your next design adventure.